In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me, that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask you pardon for my sins and the grace to spend this time of prayer fruitfully. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me. Today we're celebrating the solemnity of the divine maternity of Mary. Mary, the mother of God. A dogma that was defined not as a central point. It was more of a, a collateral definition to what was the really central topic of the famous Council of Ephesus in 431 AD. Which caused so much joy to the people. That council had basically, um, shall we say, for its main topic of discussion, the divinity of Jesus Christ. It was an answer to a, we can't really call it a heresy because at that period of Christianity, poor early Christians were grappling with the mystery, mysteries rather of the identity of our Lord Jesus Christ because something which we nowadays take so, so much as a, a matter of fact, something that we learn from childhood almost was at that time something that were new to many people, if not in its basic formulation, at least in its theoretical, metaphysical, or more important, theological explanation. Think, for example, of the mystery of the Blessed Trinity. How can there be three persons, but only one God? Now, they should take that as a matter of course. But for somebody who is hearing it for the first time, even now, sometimes when you talk to um, pagans who you're trying to convert to Christianity, you know, when they hear that, that there are three persons in one God, not three gods, only one God, but three persons, then you get into trouble. Or when you think of Jesus Christ, who is Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ is the Son of God, one of the three persons, consubstantial with the Father, co-eternal with the Father, uh, infinite, etc., etc., made man. Okay, so God became man. So therefore, Jesus Christ is what? Is he God or is he man? Because he became man. Is he medio God, medio man? So those were the, the, the things that were trying, that they were trying to understand. And one of the errors that precisely cropped up at that time was the error of the stories. That more or less went this way, that the Blessed Virgin Mary gave birth to a man, fully man with a human nature, that was Jesus Christ. Who, because he was a good man, was kind of possessed by the second person of the Blessed Trinity at the given moment, such that he became the Jesus Christ that we know of, who performed miracles, who taught, and finally who died on the cross. So therefore the Jesus Christ that we see in the gospel, <laughs> according to that error, was not the Jesus Christ that Mary gave birth to. Mary gave birth to a normal human person, human being, Jesus Christ, who then became possessed by the second person. That was more or less the error. Of course, that will have theocentric or um, theological uh, consequences as far as the personality, the identity of Jesus Christ was concerned. Mm -hmm. But a collateral question was, so therefore Mary was not the mother of God. 
Mary was the mother of Jesus, the man. But that got into a problem because popular piety, remember this was already 431. So it was already the fifth century. So four centuries already uh, of Christianity, of popular piety, and popular piety, the people had always taken Mary to be the mother of God. In Greek, Theotokos. And so for the normal people, that problem with the theological um, consideration of uh, the identity of Jesus Christ, how he could have, uh, have um, how he could be God and become man, all of those, those were beyond them. What interested them was the fact that the motherhood, the divine motherhood of Mary was being questioned. And it's told that while the council was uh, taking place in that church, which are now in ruins. In my imagination, I, I, can, I can see it uh, outside the ruins of Ephesus. It's just what you see there now is just the outline of the church, certain parts of it which are in rubble. I want to almost imagine how it was at that time. Could trace the outline of the church and how the people at that time held procession and prayed held a vigil the whole night while, while the council was taking place. And finally, the following day, when they came up with that pronouncement of the divine maternity of Mary, with the theological explanation behind it, that for most people, um, was totally, uh, shall we say, highfalutin, as we would say these days, they sang a hymn, and they sang a Te Deum, praising God that the fathers of the church had hit the nail on the head, so to speak. Let's celebrate the motherhood of Mary then. And let us adore her son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The church invites us to consider the central mystery of Mary's life, which is the foundation of all her other prerogatives. Centuries, many centuries later, precisely in the 19th century, they will define the assumption of Our Lady, body and soul to heaven. And then in the 20th century, they would define the Immaculate Conception of Mary. But all of those were in attention to a more fundamental reality in the life of Our Lady, which was that she gave birth to the incarnate word, not to a man, but to God made man that the hypostatic union, the union of the two natures, human and divine, in the one person, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, who was the one that was conceived in the womb of Our Lady, made her, therefore, the mother of God. Because one does not give birth to a nature, whether human or divine. One gives birth to a person, and who was that person that was conceived in the virginal womb of Our Lady? And the answer is very simple. The second person of the Blessed Trinity. Because in Jesus Christ, there's only one person. There are not two persons there or, or, or some kind of a mixture of a personality, half God, half man. There was only one person. The same person that was in the, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And all things were made through him, and nothing that has been made was made without him. The second person of the Blessed Trinity. And that was what, that is what we're celebrating today. Like a vine, I caused loveliness to bud, and my blossoms became glorious and abundant fruit. <clears throat> I am the, <clears throat> I am the mother <clears throat> I am the mother of beautiful love, of fear, of knowledge, and of holy hope. The church places these words from the Old Testament on Mary's lips. They express amazement at the wonders that God has worked. We too are filled with immense joy, and we exclaim with the church, Mary gave birth to the king whose name is eternal. She united the joy of a mother with the honor of a virgin. Such as this has never happened before 
nor will it happen again. What wonderful words the liturgy of the church has come up with to celebrate the divine maternity of Mary. The entrance antiphon of today's mass cries out, today a light will shine upon us for the Lord is born for us and he will be called wondrous God, Prince of Peace, <clears throat> Father of future ages. His reign will be without end. Or in an alternate entrance antiphon, which is even more beautiful, hail Holy Mother who gave birth to the King who rules heaven and earth forever. O oh God, who through the fruitful virginity of Blessed Mary bestowed on the human race the grace of eternal salvation, grant, we pray, that we may experience the intercession of her through whom we were found worthy to receive the author of life, our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Doesn't it? fill you with so much joy and so much confidence but at the same time it fills you with just a sense of responsibility because these are not just shall we say wonderful considerations praises that we heap on mary which as we were considering before is just an obedience to what she herself has prophesied that the church would do Henceforth, <clears throat> all generations will call me blessed or blessed. But he can attend there in an almost emotional outburst <clears throat> because at the same time that we heap praises on Mary, we have to be aware that we belong to that lineage. It's not enough to praise our mother, or to praise our father for that matter, or to praise our lineage. We have to protect it and live accordingly. <clears throat> we can't be a, a, shall we say, a dissonant note on an otherwise wonderful record. There is reason why every time we celebrate feasts like today. <clears throat> that extol, glorify, or even pinpoint a specific characteristic, virtue, quality, or even a personal trait, like for example, now the divine maternity of Mary, of our Blessed Mother, then it behooves us to immediately examine ourselves. I belong to that lineage. Jesus Christ hanging on the cross precisely made me a son of Mary and gave me certain responsibilities. Behold your mother at the same time entrusting me to her. Behold your son. The thing is, the consequence of that always is, what am I doing to live up to that, shall we say, commitment? What am I living to live up to that assignment, to that dignity that had been bestowed on me? Part of the <clears throat> itinerary with which I always end the pilgrimage to the Holy Land. I have organized several, five to be exact. Um, includes or is always a trip to Ephesus. Because in the same way that it has been said that <clears throat> the Holy Land, the Holy Places in Israel speak to us much like a fifth gospel aside from the four gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John that those holy places themselves speak to us as well and that's true when you go there in an attitude of a pilgrim not in a touristic mode much less a buying mode but in a prayerful mode prayerful and penitential having prepared it with a good confession spending time in the holy places, praying, perhaps even celebrating the Eucharist. Then those sites speak to us in the same way that when we read the gospel, they speak to us. 
But the holy land is holy precisely because that's the land where our Lord walked. But the church that he established, as you know very well, spread out of that pretty quickly. And the initial spread, the place where the apostles, the theater of operation of the apostolane, the mission, the sending of the apostles was Asia Minor. And Asia Minor is Turkey. And there's a reason why many of the churches that we read there in the Acts of the Apostles, Ephesus, uh, <clears throat> Chalcedon, of course, uh, Constantinople, Laodicea, Philadelphia, um, you know, those seven churches, Smyrna, well, all of those are in Turkey. That's why it's nice to end that trip in Turkey. Unfortunately, Turkey is now Muslim. And so therefore many of those early <clears throat> churches founded by the apostles are not there anymore. But a quite remarkable place to go is Ephesus. Why? Precisely because Our Lady, together with St. John, spent their last days there. In a little house in a hill outside the old city of Ephesus. And when you go up that hill and you go to the house of Mary, the house of Mary and John, the beloved disciple, and you can see the house is still existing there. You see the remains of the old house up to a certain level, maybe one meter from the ground, a little bit more. The old bricks, which have been destroyed through time, but then they had rebuilt it. And so you see the line and it's amazing when you go to that place. Because in many places in Palestine or in Israel, you're odd. And perhaps distracted because there's really just too many people. But when you go to that place, as small as it may be, big enough <clears throat> to be considered a house, big enough to be considered a chapel. But then they let the people in strictly in a limited way. So when you go in, you don't encounter a crowd. You can really be alone. And there you can pray. You can be transported to the ambience of how it must have felt like just with Our Lady and St. John, the beloved disciple. And it's in a complex, meaning to say it's not just that house. Remember, it's on top of a, a hill. <clears throat> one could consider it a mountain already. So there's, <clears throat> there's relative privacy, there's relative isolation if you want to. And there are other structures there where you, one can celebrate mass and I've celebrated mass there every time. But what I wanted to mention or to bring up with this recollection is the fact that in the life of the early church, even if Mary may have been apart there, because Ephesus is a little bit apart. It's not that near. I mean, the, the, the house of Our Lady is not that near to Ephesus, which was where the early Christians were living. That was the city. But the one can always say, yeah, but Ephesus at that time was a Greco-Roman uh, city, a harbor. So one can imagine what kind of life was being led there. All the... Um, shall we say, the immorality that was rampant in the decaying Roman Empire. That's the reason why they weren't there. They were living in the privacy of a hill. But I wanted what I wanted to bring up was the fact that even if they were away, the presence of our Blessed Mother on that hill must have been a, I don't know, some kind of a, 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 a soothing, force, maternal influence that I'm sure the Christians of Ephesus felt, but definitely Mary felt in the same way that she was beholding St. John, looking at him, taking care of him, vice versa was true, or rather he was, she was doing the same thing with the people of Ephesus and with all of us.
In his letter to the Galatians, St. Paul says, Brothers and sisters, when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to ransom those under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. As proof that you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, <clears throat> crying out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then also an heir through God. The reality of our divine filiation. This choice of second reading for today's Mass is no accident. Because today we're affirming, we're celebrating the divine maternity of Mary, which is therefore like uh, we said earlier, like a collateral definition of a more fundamental reality, which is <clears throat> the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. That Mary is the mother of God because he who was born of her, Jesus Christ, was God incarnate. In Jesus Christ, you have one person, but you have two natures, an integral divine nature which has always been with that person, co-eternal with the Father, consubstantial with the Father, the same nature as the Father. But at the same time, at that very moment of the conception of our Lord in the virginal womb of Our Lady, a human nature, also integral in everything like ours, except in sin. That was the definition in the Council of Ephesus. And the consequence for us, and what behooves us right now in this meditation, this time of the year, new year, new life, new normal, is to look at it from the other side, which is that you and I, because of baptism, have also, shall we say, united in ourselves, in our person, and we're human persons, not divine persons, in a moral union, not quite substantial, but moral, spiritual, the divine nature of the Spirit of God. And where the Spirit is, then the Father and the Son also, with ours. Meaning to say, in a, it's, this is a, what do you call it? It's a similarity, an, an, an analogical, <clears throat> in an analogical way, so as to understand it, that because of baptism, the Holy Spirit, and where the Holy Spirit is, the Father and the Son, is also blown into us like what happened with Adam and Eve, such that that indwelling of the Blessed Trinity in us causes a change in our nature. So that we're not natural man, men and women anymore. We have become supernatural. And what does that mean? <laughs> Sometimes they say super size, right? Or souped up version. Or when you have a limited edition of a given uh, model of a car. And what makes it so special, that limited edition? Well, it's done in a more careful way so that there are no factory defects. Plus, they may add certain things there. A turbocharger, a catalytic converter, or uh, a special edition of the, of the uh, shall we say, the ignition uh, computer, whatever. So we're not stock cars anymore. That's what that means. And that's the reason why baptism is so important. But it's also the reason why when you hear words, especially from a priest of Opus Dei, insisting on struggling and struggling heroically. And then you got to wonder, heroically, but heroic means larger than life. But on the other hand, you keep on telling us to be ordinary people in the middle of the world. Yes, those, things, those two things are compatible in much the same way that a limited edition is a special, but it's still quote unquote, the same model as the rest. It's just a special. 
And the baptized person is special because of that, because of the indwelling of the blessed Trinity, which is not going to happen. Somebody who is not baptized and somebody who does not have that indwelling. They're the same stock cars, but one is a limited edition. It's a special edition. And all of that are the consequences of today's solemnity. Because Jesus Christ had to be born in order to die, to gain for us, regain for us that which we lost with the first sin of our first parents. That's why the gospel acclamation of the mass says, in the past, God spoke to our fathers through the prophets, the Israelites. Now he speaks to us through his son. The gospel passage of today's mass is no less, shall we say, provoking. It's something that we had already considered very recently. There's a reason why I am not going to go in depth to it now because we already had. But let me just read through it again in order to savor it and perhaps to draw one thing. The shepherds went with in haste to Bethlehem and found Mary and Joseph and the infant lying in the manger. The adoration of the shepherds, remember. When they saw this, they made known the message that had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed by what had been told them by the shepherds. And Mary kept all these things, pondering them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, just as it had been told to them. And when eight days were completed for his circumcision, he was named Jesus, the name given him by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And the, the detail that I wanted to draw out from that reading was this, that Mary kept all these things, pondering them in her heart. Because that verse reappears several times in the accounts of Mary, especially in the infancy narratives. Contemplating the mysteries that were unfolding before her eyes and previously being announced by the angel even. Sublime mysteries of the history of salvation, sublime mysteries of the will of God towards man, mankind. Mysteries that therefore exceed the normal capacity of the human mind, which she, in her humility and in her love, together with hope, did not just pass on. Did not just even resign into, oh, this is too big. And I cannot understand it. So park it there somewhere. Put it in a, in a compartment somewhere. Perhaps in the deep recesses even of her memory. No, what did she do? She pondered them in her heart. Now this idea of pondering mysteries, pondering the things of God, pondering the things that we just get an inkling of in our prayer or perhaps in a talk or in a meditation is something that we need to learn because precisely the malady of our era already pointed out by Pope Pius XI way back there 1921 I think Mens Noster in that letter that the malady of our age is that people don't reflect enough, the lack of reflection. We hear things. We may even register them, but we don't reflect on them. You have heard many things in these meditations, especially of late, in a wind up to Christmas during Advent, the days of the, uh, the octave of Christmas. And now, I'm sure many things must have hit you. I invite you now to reflect on them. Look again at your notes. Consider them even deeper. Now with the luxury of time, meaning to say there are not so many things coming one after the other, like what happened in the previous weeks. 
in this halcyon days of Christmas time. That's the reason why we need to celebrate the whole of Christmas. We need to see all the way to the baptism of our Lord or to Santo Nino, which is already in the second week of January. In order to reflect, even when you eat something and it's good, you savor it. There's an aftertaste. And if you experience something good, you replay it in your mind. Even, you know, things that you watch on Netflix or funny incidents or songs, you replay them in your mind. Well, the sublime mysteries of our faith, we definitely have to replay them in our mind. How do you think? Because sometimes people ask me, where do you get so many things from a simple passage that comes out in the, come out in the meditation, meditations? Well, this thinking and rethinking, savoring, contemplating, looking with love, that's what we need to do. And that's what our mother is teaching us here, to keep all these things, pondering them in her heart. Well, we have to end. Perhaps that's a resolution we can make on a day like today. It's so great the mystery, the divine maternity of Mary, that had that would take centuries later on to draw consequences which would be defined. But don't forget it, that those definitions that would take centuries, this one, the divine maternity, four centuries, almost five for the council to define. Her immaculate conception, already in the 20th century. The assumption, already in the 19th century, but in the common people, the men in the streets, the popular piety of the early Christians, all of those were already present. And that's the reason why there's a tradition to them. There are representations of them. There are churches designed around them, which later on became one of the arguments for defining them that this is not something that we're inventing now, that the early Christians already believed it. And why did they believe that? They must have heard it from the apostles themselves, considerations like those. And they pondered them in their heart. They grew to be firm convictions, reflected not just in thoughts or in feelings, but in art, in culture, even in pageantry. Definitely in works of art, whole churches designed. That's what happens when you ponder. A thing may start as a movement in the heart, which is elaborated by the mind. But if that were true intellectual process, it overflows into a decision, into a moral choice, into action that further cements that conviction and defines us the way we should be. Children of Mary, brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ, sons of our heavenly father, imbued by the same spirit, the spirit of divine sonship that makes us say, addressing our father, Abba, Papa, Daddy, in that intimate way, and our blessed mother, mother, mommy. I think I've exceeded my time once more, but I leave you some moments to formulate your own resolutions so that you can end this prayer yourselves. Mm -hmm.